Amen. Daniel chapter 3. Uh, in many ways, this morning's message uh, is for Christians, people that have decided to follow Jesus. And I know not everybody in this room uh, has made that commitment yet, and we're glad that you're here. Um, we're glad that you're uh, considering and open. And I think what you'll hear, other than the message for the Christians, is you are going to hear about uh, a great God who we love and worship and what he can do. We're going to get to Daniel chapter 3 in a moment. Last week, the teens, uh, our youth group, went to uh, Woonsocket and Cumberland to pray. Uh, on a Saturday, they got together and they went up to Woonsocket, City Hall, and Cumberland Town Hall. And that's what they did with their time, the teens, outside in front of the City Hall, uh, praying together. Right? And you can pray and not let anybody know. Right? You could be praying and walking around and having your eyes wide open. Or you can, you know get in a circle and hold hands and put your heads down or go like this, right? And it's more obvious that you're praying. And so that's how they were praying in front of the Woonsocket Town Hall. And while they were praying, some of the teens remarked that they started to feel a little nervous and uncomfortable because people were looking at them and were kind of making faces, um, wondering what they were doing. And so the experience of them praying was awesome. They went out there, they put themselves out there publicly to pray, and they went to Woonsocket which when I first moved to Rhode Island, someone said, I'm from Woonsocket, and I laughed. I thought they had made that up. <laughs> and sure enough, they went to Woonsocket, and they prayed. But as they were leaving and going to Cumberland, they were a little nervous. They were a little, uh, there was a little bit of anxiety because they are aware that they were putting themselves in an uncomfortable position and that other people that had looked at them while they were in Woonsocket had sort of not looked on with pleasure and support but maybe with some concern or some disagreement. And so now they're going to go do this again. How do you feel about that? Are you, are you going to do it with the same passion and heart that you uh, did when you were driving up to Woonsocket and saying, we're praying, this is awesome, I'm so blessed to do this? Or are you going to tone it down a little bit? Are you going to be a little uh, more nervous? Are you going to do less of this and more of this, right? Are they going to sit at the city hall in the prayer posture that people might see it if... After all, the last place they went, they felt uncomfortable. Are they going to do it? This is hard. I don't know if this is something I want to do, they might be thinking. And sure enough, they went there. They went to the city hall. They prayed. They prayed in the prayer posture that was obvious. And while they were praying, someone honked their horn at them while they were driving by and went like this. For those of you listening online, it's the thumb I'm raising of the fingers. And uh, it's the, the finger of support. You think about that, they got some pressure at the first place, and the second place, they got some support. Imagine if they had gotten the support in the first place, they would have been like, hey, this is awesome. Serving God is, is, is cool. This is wonderful. I feel good about myself. And then they would have gone to the next place, and it would have been down. What they discovered that day was that they were going to pray and do what was right. End of sentence. Not based on what other people were saying, what other people were thinking. They were choosing to do what was right no matter the circumstances because God is worthy of honor. And because God is good no matter what else is going on. No matter what responses people are giving. And, and that really begins to uh, reveal a maturity level in someone. You know, when you uh, first see God, it oftentimes is because uh, it, it's sort of like your motive is self-preservation. Perhaps you hear the gospel and you hear that, that there are consequences to sin and that there is going to be a judgment day, that there is a lake of fire, and you turn to Christ for salvation because there's forgiveness there. And you can escape death and you can escape hell, and you're like, yes, I want that. And so you turn to God because you do not want to be judged. You do not want to be destroyed. You do not want to go to the lake of fire. And that's a good reason to turn to Christ. But then as you grow and as you mature, that begins to change. And now you begin to uh, serve God, not so much because you don't want to go to hell, but because you want to have eternal life and you want to finish the race set before you and, and hear well done and see him in his glorious kingdom when he sets all that is wrong with the world right. And then you're growing in maturity. It's not about, I don't want to go to hell. It's like, no, God, I want to, I want to have eternal life. And that's a, that's, that's a beautiful sh shift that must happen in the heart of a Christian to mature. But even that is not the final place you want to arrive in your Christian maturity because that still, in a sense, is about you. 
It's not so much about not going to hell. It's about you going to the good place. God, I want to be there instead. Ultimately, the, the next level of spiritual maturity is, God, I want you. If for some reason, God, I've, I've misunderstood scripture and there is no eternal life, I still want to live for you because you are great. I don't want to just live for you because of what I get or don't get. I've gotten you, Lord, and you're worth my life no matter how long or short it might be. Now, there is eternal life. Don't tune out there. There is great reward. There is new bodies and resurrection. But a place of Christian maturity that we see in Scripture is men and women who say, God, it's not about me not going to hell. It's not about me going to your kingdom. It's about me giving you the glory because he's worthy of it all. You know, as a church and me, not even as a pastor, but as a Christian, I want to be there. I want God to stir up my soul so that I'm not just like doing it because of what I get and what I don't get. I want to live for God because he's worthy of it. I want to take the next step in my Christian life where I'm not just asking, what's the bare minimum required? Now, you might be there today, and, and, I, and that's okay. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you're even thinking about spiritual things. But I think for some of us, and I think for our church, I think it's time for us to level up. I think it's time for us to grow in maturity, to be stirred a little bit more, not just, God, what are, what are you giving to me? But, God, what can I give to you? Not, what's the bare minimum that I can do to make it? Or what's the bare minimum I can not do to not lose it? But, God, what can I do? to live for you today. Anybody want to be like that? Yeah. I want to be like that. I want to consecrate myself and say, God, I don't want just the bare minimum. I want to level up. And I think that's what God is calling us to today. And that brings us to Daniel chapter three, this great story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace. And there's going to be some names in this story today. And one of the things that I like to do is just see if you're paying attention by saying, say this name and tell your neighbor this. So just get ready. It's Labor Day weekend, but we've got some work to do, nevertheless. First word of chapter 3, Nebuchadnezzar. Say that one. Nebuchadnezzar. Look at you. You're doing just great. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height which was 60 cubits, and its width was 6 cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. 90 feet high and 9 feet wide was the statue. 90 feet high. Amazing. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of this image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of the world, king of an empire, historical empire of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was a real guy. You can study him in the encyclopedia or look him up on Wikipedia. Nebuchadnezzar is calling for all of his rulers from all of his empire to come and worship this image that he has set up. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. All those names, satraps, prefects, those are different kinds of rulers and we'll see them, we'll see them a few times. Verse 3. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces, they were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And then the herald loudly proclaimed, here was the announcement over the, over the trumpet, over the speaker, to you the command is given, O people, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music. You are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of what? Fire. Not just fire, blazing fire. Verse 7. Therefore, at the time when all the people heard the sounds of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the people, nations, and men of every language, they fell down and they worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. He calls for all of his leaders, all of his rulers, and all the people of the empire to come to see this image that he made. He is a godlike figure, Nebuchadnezzar. And now they're worshiping this image that he set up as the new idol, as a new god. And he says, when you hear the, the band strike their chords, everyone will fall down. The signal that it was time to worship was that the, 
musicians would begin to play. And verse 7 tells us about this great sea of people that are standing there. And when the music plays, they all fall down and worship. I, as I read this, I thought of just like a, 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 a sea of people, a flow of people, everyone in this assembly, hundreds, thousands of people all standing there. And when the music played, bowing down to worship, worship this image. Now, these people did not have uh, some sort of standard that would forbid them from doing this. They're just trying to keep their job, perhaps. Maybe they thought it was a beautiful statue. I don't know the motivation. Some of them might have done it just because they didn't want to go into the fiery furnace. I'm sorry, the furnace of blazing fire. Because if you don't bow down and worship this statue, this image, not only do you lose your job, you lose your life. Now, those of you that have heard this story before and know the ending, none of the people in that congregation that day did. They're living their life. They're going through the motions of their day. They're hearing the announcements. They're making their decisions. And when the music played, they bowed. Verse 8. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. And they responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar, the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, you've made a decree that anyone who hears the sound of all those instruments that I've said a bunch of times already should fall down. Verse 11. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of what kind of fire? There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, say Shadrach, Shadrach. Meshach, say Meshach, and Abednego, say Abednego, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. So as the trumpets blaze and the trigon is rang out, there are a few people in Babylon who did not bow, and word gets back to Nebuchadnezzar. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Jews that had been taken from their land in Israel and Jerusalem and brought to Babylon who were serving in the Babylonian king's courts. But you see, something was different about the Jews. They served the living God. They served the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, whose name is Yahweh, who had delivered them and given them promises, and given them covenants, and given them commandments. And I don't know if you know, but the first of the commandments that God gave to his people was, I am Yahweh your God, and you shall have no other gods but me. And the second was, you shall not make a graven image of any likeness on earth, in the heaven, under, the, uh, under heaven, under the earth. You shall not make any image and worship it. One God, whose name is Yahweh, no idols. That was written into their souls every day of their lives. When a Jewish child is born, their parents whisper into their ears so that it's the first thing that they hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The Lord is our God. Love him with everything. That's the first thing they hear. And they hear this growing up over and over and over again that you don't worship idols. And so when it's time to worship idols in Babylon, what are the Jews doing? Not worshiping idols. But at this day, there's a cost. And so they get brought before Nebuchadnezzar. And as I was thinking about this, in a sense, now they have a, a second chance. If they choose, when the music starts to play, to not bow down, their lives are spared. Maybe they can do one of these, like, cross your fingers and, like, wink while you're going down. <laughs> right? Maybe you go, well, when I was looking at the image, I was thinking about the Lord in my heart. So it was kind of like I was worshiping the Lord. And so, like, I didn't think it was that big a deal. Right? That would have been Meshach saying it like that. Right? <laughs> Pressure is on. What are they going to do? The announcement gets made. They're in their own homes. Yeah, easy. But they got found out, and now they get brought before the very one that set up the image, who made this decree, and they have to face him. Verse 14, here's their second chance. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image I've set up? Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, 
to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? If you compromise, young men, you will be spared. Compromise, in this story, you would think, spares you. But the truth is, for God's people, compromise kills. Courage is what saves us. Conviction is what we want. Boldness and, and a determination and a resolve in our soul amidst an evil world is what we want. Not compromise. It's easy to compromise. I know how to compromise. But these men on this day are faced with the king, giving them another chance. And what will they say? Well, here we go. Verse 16. Some of the most inspiring verses in scripture. Are you ready? Okay. Lois is ready. Is anyone else ready? All right. Shortest sermon ever. No, they just weren't ready. They said, no, nah, we'll come back next week. It's fine. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they replied to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. In other words, we don't need a lot of time to think about this. Here's our answer. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Wow. They're not losing their job if they make this decision. They're losing their lives. And what they say is, the God we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace, and he will deliver us from the furnace. God's people need to believe that. God's people need to believe that we serve a God that is able to deliver us. That's the, first, that's the first thing there, right? If it be so, if we get thrown in the fire, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. Say, God is able to deliver me. We have to believe that. I know some of you have, had prayers, have prayers gone unanswered. You've been through difficulty. You've had loss, trial, and tragedy. And those things have a tendency sometimes to chip away at our belief and our confidence. We've prayed for people and things haven't resolved themselves. And so we forget that God is able to answer prayers. I've been through that situation. I've gone to the hospital and prayed with people and I didn't believe the words I was praying. Sometimes life will do that to you and make you think that maybe it's not to be. But that's me. That's not him. God is able to deliver. There have been other times when I have prayed and a miracle happened. There have been times when God has come through. And these three men are remembering and counting on the God that has for generations showed himself faithful. He delivered them from slavery. He delivered them through the Red Sea. He took care of them when the Philistines attacked and they raised up David. They know the story that God is able to deliver. And on that day, they are saying, we believe that God is able to deliver us. And then you know what else they say? They say, and he will. Because it's one thing to believe that he's got the power it's another thing to believe that he's going to show that power on your behalf. And you might have been talked out of that too. Don't be talked out of that. God is not just able to deliver, he does deliver. We've got testimonies in this room about God showing his hand and delivering people. Do not raise your hand if you do not feel like you can honestly say what I'm about to say. But if you can, raise it high. Has the God who has the power to deliver and work in your life, has he ever delivered you and worked in your life? Raise your hand. Okay. You can put your hands down. Okay. If, if somebody was sitting by you with their hand up and you weren't ready to put it up yet, don't let that person leave without saying, you got to tell me what's going on here because I'm not feeling it this morning. The God that we serve, the God that they serve, same God, not only is able to deliver us, but he will deliver us. What confidence these men have. 
Think about all the stories in Scripture where God just comes on through. They're banking on it. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. And then verse 18 starts with what word? But. But. He's able and he will, but even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. That's leveling up right there. That's maturity right there. God is able to, and he will, but even if he doesn't, no matter what, I am going to stand upon his word. He's able to take care of me, and I believe he will, but even if it doesn't work out, I am going to finish the course of my life living for him. If the prayer doesn't get answered the way I want, I'm living for him. If things don't turn out exactly like I had hoped and I beg God to do, he will still receive my worship because he's worthy of it. I'm not in it just what I get from him. I'm in it to give him a little bit about what he a little bit of what he deserves. These men are mature. These men have leveled up. They're standing before the king threatening their lives saying God is going to deliver us and even if he does not we will not compromise. We will not bow. Woo! Give me some of that, please, Lord. Their obedience on this day is not dependent on their circumstances. When you and I don't know what will happen if we go with God, if we obey God, we, if we don't know what's going to happen, but we choose to live our lives for God, that's faith. That's what it means to live by faith. If you know what's going to happen when you do something, that doesn't require faith. Faith is, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm still going to do what God wants me to do. Increase our faith, O oh Lord. A lot of the things that I choose to do, I choose to do because I'm pretty sure how it's going to turn out. That's not faith. That might be obedience, but that's not faith. These men have faith. They do not know the verses that you already have read ahead in. They do not know what's going to happen, but they have resolved in their soul to believe that God is able, that he will deliver him, but regardless of whether or not he does, they are not going to bow. And so we continue on. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was so inspired by their courage that he immediately turned his life over to the true God. Is that what it says in your Bible? It doesn't. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath. Their courage didn't inspire him to turn. It ticked him off. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath and his facial expression was altered. I'm not going to give you an example. I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he answered by giving orders for the heat of the furnace to be turned up seven times more than it was usually heated. And he commanded certain valiant warriors who were in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them in the furnace of blazing fire. Then those men, these men, were tied up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not only is it seven... Uh, Seven times hotter, they're tied up. Verse 21 says that they were also tied up in their trousers, in their coats, their caps, and other clothes. Some of you, if you had to be fully dressed on a hot summer day, would die. <laughs> they're about to walk into the furnace. They were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. For this reason, because the king's command was urgent, and the furnace had been made extremely hot. The flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire, still tied up. Now, if you know the end of the story, I want you to think about something that maybe you don't think about because you know the end. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not delivered from being thrown into the fiery furnace. It 
Isn't the Bible story supposed to go, the men have courage, and then all of a sudden the fire goes out, and they go, ah, our God is real? That might be a fairy tale or a, 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 a cheap knockoff of, of the true story of Scripture, but in this story, the men that took a stand for God were not delivered from being thrown into the fiery furnace. They have no uh, awareness of the outcome. They're living this in real time, just like you and I are living our lives in real time. They, dis they, they determine that they're going to live for God no matter what. They're going to confess that. They're not going to compromise when they have opportunity to. They're going to stand in the face of threats, and then they get thrown into the fiery furnace. They're... Trust in God was not dependent on the outcomes. Their trust in God was dependent on the fact that he was worthy of their lives. These were mature men who had leveled up, who weren't just thinking about the bare minimum they could give in their religious service. They were going to live for their God no matter what. And on this day, they got thrown in. If the story ended there, I would say, I want to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What bravery, what courage, what conviction to not just go along with what everybody else is doing and, and take the easy way out. I do that all the time. Oh, God, increase my faith. They get thrown into the fire furnace. The men that threw them in there are consumed by the fire. And then we read that Nebuchadnezzar looks in. In verse 24, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded and stood up in haste. And he said to his high officials, Was it not three men that were cast bound into the midst of the fire? And they replied, King, certainly, O king. And he said, Look, I see four men. How many men? Four men, loosed, loosed, and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth, different than the others, is like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire, and he responded, and he, he yelled in, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. <laughs> come out, you servants of the Most High God, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did what? They came out of the midst of the fire. They get thrown in, they walk out. The satraps, the prefects, the governors, the king's high officials, the gathered, they gathered around and they saw in regards to these men that the fire had no effect on their bodies of these men, nor was the hair of their head singed nor were their trousers damaged, my favorite part, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. I went to water fire last night, and I'm sitting yards away from the fire, and I went home, and I smelled like campfire. They didn't even smell like fire. They didn't even smell like smoke, and Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies so as to not serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other god who is able to do what? deliver in this way. He's able, he will, but even if he doesn't, oh, he did. The king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. If, if the morning of this day, uh, an angel was sent to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, do you want the nations to know the renown of the Lord Most High? They would have said yes. But they did not know that the way that the nations are going to know the renown of the living God was how they endured their difficulty. How they endured their suffering was what made it so the nations knew that God was great. But they did. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to stand for God no matter what. No matter what. matter what. It was through their trials. It was through their suffering. It was through their confession of 
even if he doesn't, we're going to still serve him. Even if he doesn't, we're still going to worship him. Even if he doesn't, we're still going to praise him. Even if he doesn't, we're not going to compromise. These men said, no matter what, our lives and the direction of our lives is already determined. We're living for God. And through their suffering, through their trial, through their being thrown in, God got the glory. Our pain, our trials, our challenges, the fires of our lives shape us and refine us and mature us to know and testify more of God's goodness. Through difficulty, we see who God is. The story last week, the story this week, it might, might be very easy for us to say, well, why didn't God just like turn the fire out? With Jonathan taking a stand to go up to the top of the mountain last week? Why didn't God just destroy the Philistines without him having to do anything? Have right? you ever wonder that? Why didn't like Goliath just like wake up one morning and like have a stroke or something, right? Like why does it take someone, a man or a woman, like stepping out in faith? The reason why that's the way God works is because the ultimate goal and, and purpose of life is for you and I to come to know God and to experience him. And we experience him when we go on the mountaintop. We experience him when we run towards Goliath. We experience him when we say, we're not bowing no matter what, which way is the fire. These men experience God. They didn't build their lives to avoid all challenges. They built their lives to say, we're living for God. Come what may. And so for us this morning with this inspiring example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I want to propose two things for us to consider so that we can level up and mature. I think what you see in these two men, or in these three men, are two virtues. Number one, they knew who they are and whose they are. Who you are and whose you are. In the beginning of Daniel, it says this, that the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel, he assigned the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, the name Shadrach. To Mishael, the name Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Now, we don't see these names in uh, chapter 3 here, but these three boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that wasn't their real name. That wasn't their given name. Their real name was Hananiah. Say that. Hananiah. Azariah. And Mishael, that was their real name. They literally are called another name. They're literally given a new identity by the world around them. So much so that in Daniel chapter 3, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Not Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Their given name has meaning. And the given name and the meaning that it had helped them remember who they really were. The name Shadrach was not his name. It was Hananiah. You know what the name Hananiah means? Yahweh has been gracious. Meshach, his name was really Mishael, which really means who is what God is? Who's like God? And Abednego, his real name was Azariah, which means Yahweh is my helper. So they're standing there with choices and decisions to make, being called their Babylonian fake God names, but they knew who they really were. They knew that they weren't really Shadrach. They were Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And their names reminded them of who they really were. Hananiah standing there going, God has been gracious to me. Mishael. Who is like God is? Azariah, Yahweh is my helper. Is my helper. Not might be. Is my helper. And because they knew who they were, they could face anything. They could face anything. They're not where they're supposed to be. They're not experiencing what they're supposed to experience. But who they were was unchanged. 
They knew who they were. And so when the world tries to pressure you and give you other options and lie to you and tell you you're something that you're not and all the rest, if you remember who you really are, child of God, loved by God, favored by God, forgiven by God, bought by God, adopted by God, purchased by God, cared for by God, provided for by God, God's own possession, then that's truer than anything else that you're facing. If you know who you are, come what may. When when who you are is defined by God on the inside, you will be who you need to be on the outside. And the second th- thing we see in these men is they know whose they are. Not just who they are, but whose they are. They believed that their God, Yahweh, is able to deliver and will deliver. They had experienced the goodness and power of God, and it was real. It wasn't emotion. They knew God had worked in their life. They knew they belonged to God. It was more than just their name. It was everything about them. They knew that they belonged to God, even living in a strange and foreign land. And so when they get, they get presented with the opportunity to compromise their faith in the great God of heaven, to worship a big old statue? <laughs> Easy. When they're seduced by evil around them to come and go be like everybody else in Babylon, let's say it together. <laughs> Why would I ever dishonor my God by making a compromise for a person, for a statue, because of pressure? Because things are hard, I'm going to quit on God? Not them. That's maturity. They belonged to God and believed that they were never alone. They were never unseen. That they were never helpless. They belong to God and he is able and he will deliver them. But even if he doesn't, they belong to him in the end. So for us today, here is the promise of God for you. Not a perfect life, not an easy road, not everything working out the way you want it to work out, not pain-free, not problem-free, not without heartache, not without hurt, but God with you in the fire. Can you imagine what they said when they walked out of the fire together? When Nebuch- I would have been tempted. Nebuchadnezzar was like, come out. I'd be like, no, you come get me, man. You threw me in, come get me. <laughs> Can you imagine these three men, Hanani, Mishael, and Azariah, coming out of the fire together, what they might have said to each other? Seeing that God, who has the power to deliver, did actually deliver them, and even when they were put to the test, they, they still didn't compromise. Can you imagine what they said to each other? I- After they were like, Dude, God's amazing. Come on, you know what? The secret handshake, right, that they did. Maybe they said this. It was worth it. It was worth it. God came through. I'm so glad we chose his way. What about us? What are we going to say in that last day when we put our trust in God, knowing that he was with us through the difficulty, through the fire? You and I might be delivered from the fire. We may not be. You and I might be spared from the fire. We might have to go through the fire. But as scripture says, what will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No. In all these things. Say, in all these things. In. In, Notice the text. In. In. All these things, in the trials, in the difficulty, in the peril, in the heartache, in the difficulty, in the relational challenges, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, 
nor principalities, nor things, present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. There is coming a day when God's people will be gathered together, seeing all the choices and all the challenges and the difficulties that we endured in this life, and we will see God's victory, and we will see God's face, and we will no, we will no longer smell the smoke. We will no longer smell the smoke because the Lord will deliver us fully and completely in that day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, as we uh, consider these men this morning, I pray that you would help work this in our soul. It's an inspiring story, God, thank you. But I'm going to go eat a hot dog and go to a party and go to a barbecue and uh, have the day off tomorrow. And it's very easy for this to just fizzle out and be like, oh, that was nice. And so God here for this moment, I pray that you would work these things in my soul, that you would stir me and not let me be inspired only for it to fade. Please, God, we need you to do a work in our hearts. We are not the most courageous. We are not ready to stand when the fire gets turned up. So God, please help us. Help me, God, today not make the little compromises. To not forget you when there's little decisions to make. But I pray that as a church, you would mature us. Ask God to mature you right now. Just say, God, help me to mature. Help me to, to be like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah to be in it for you, God, no matter what. Yeah, Lord, please plant a seed in our soul that grows and blooms and causes us to grow in a way that will bring you the glory. Because you're so worthy of it. We pray this in the name of our, our King and Savior, Jesus.